PFT PM policy in playmakers. You mentioned how Rams quarterback case Keenum wasn't checked for a concussion and nobody got punished because there were so many people who screwed up. Is that the loophole for teams splitting the responsibilities because with multiple people, uh, nobody's fully responsible. And yeah, that, that's the point that we make in playmakers. And I argued at the time, there are so many people with their finger on the button to, sh to shut down the game and check someone for a concussion that, that everyone with the finger on the button is deferring to someone else. And nobody wants to be the one to press the button and stop a game, especially in crunch time, games on the line. We're going to take out the quarterback of one of the teams when if you take him out and you put in his backup, all of a sudden, all hope is lost. We've seen that in big games, whether it was the Panthers Broncos week one, 2016, when Cam Newton was being bruised and battered and nobody said maybe he should come out and get checked as they're driving down the field for a potential game winning field goal. I think the field goal was missed and the Broncos won that game, whether it's playoff game and Julian Edelman remember in the Super Bowl. Julian Edelman got his bell wrong, never got taken out to be checked. It's happened before. And fortunately for the NFL, there hasn't been a worst case scenario with someone who has a concussion, was left in a game and got another concussion and had some serious health consequence. That's the risk. But the other side of that coin for the NFL, and coin is always the operative word, you don't want to take out a key player in a key moment of a key game and have that affect the outcome of the game. If a quarterback or some other important player isn't available and it's not easy it's not easy the nfl is lucky that there haven't been many major controversies on that point in recent years and one of the reasons is they're doing everything they can to minimize the situations where somebody would even potentially have a head injury it's still unavoidable to a certain extent but as they carve away the different circumstances where a head injury can happen they make certain techniques illegal it does, as a practical matter, reduce the total number of situations where somebody could get a concussion during games. And they're trying to reduce the number of concussions during games because they understand it can be, if unaddressed, an existential threat to the entire operation. PFT PM Posse again, how can the NFL or any rich and powerful people for that matter push any case they want to the Supreme Court? Shouldn't it be used more for things affecting more slash most Americans? Let's pretend it's a legitimate Supreme Court for this exercise and not the current Supreme Court. Yeah, here's what the NFL does. And this has come up as it relates to the NFL's obsession with arbitration, the secret rig kangaroo court of Roger Goodell that they try to push every controversy into. They did it with the St. Louis relocation case, pushed it through the Missouri courts. And then when they didn't get the ruling they wanted there, they filed what they call a petition for writ of certiorari to the US Supreme Court. And whether you exhaust all your appeals in a state or you exhaust your appeals in the federal system, the last ditch effort is to ask the Supreme Court to take up the case. And there are literally thousands of petitions every year that go to the Supreme Court. Everyone's got the right to do that. It's not a matter of the rich and the powerful. Everyone's got the right to ask the Supreme Court to take up the case. And the Supreme Court only takes up a handful of cases every year. And I don't want to get into the details as to why the Supreme Court makes the decisions that it makes, but the bottom line is you have the right to take it up. You have the right to try to convince the Supreme Court to agree to hear your case. Now, sometimes what is good news on the front end, hey, the Supreme Court's taken my case, becomes bad news. The Supreme Court has taken the case to rule against you, but you, you, you lose if they don't take up the case anyway. So at a minimum, you delay the eventual defeat if they take up your case and you have a chance of winning. But it's, it's not some nefarious thing that is reserved only to the rich and powerful. Anyone can do it. It's not all that expensive. And uh, it's usually something that, that fails because the Supreme Court, again, only takes up a few cases a year. PFTP and Posse, boy, all sorts of different topics today from uh, the PFTP and Posse account. How would TB12 owning a piece of a team, i.e. the Dolphins, or a promise to be offered a piece of the team upon retirement be treated with regards to the salary cap. Well, there was an issue with John Elway years ago under the salary cap and Pat Bolin wanted to give him a piece of the team and, and something blew up there. And I saw, I saw someone do the math that if it had gone through Elway would have made hundreds of millions of dollars as part of the sale of the Broncos. Now the salary cap is a factor, but there are ways around it and you have to work your way around it. And it would have gotten strange and awkward if Tom Brady had bought a piece of the dolphins 
and then became the quarterback of the Dolphins. But but really, if you sell it for fair value, if you say it's it's like, hey, we're gonna, I'm going to give you 10% of the team for $10, that would be a sign that something is amiss. If it is consistent with the value of the team, then you don't get into a salary cap issue. But uh, it, it's definitely a potential minefield for any team that would try to do something like that. And it's one of the reasons why it rarely, if ever, gets done. Tom Marshall, otherwise known as A-Red Zona UK, is it inevitable that any suspension for Deshaun Watson will be reduced on appeal? Now, I, I don't think it's inevitable. I think, if anything, it's inevitable that it would be increased on appeal. Because I think the NFL comes in, minimum one year, with an indefinite suspension aimed at protecting the NFL in the event there are more cases filed against Deshaun Watson in the future. Judge Sue L. Robinson reduces it. And then Commissioner Goodell says, no, not good enough. We're, we're going we're gonna to increase it back to what we originally wanted. So I don't think it's inevitable it's reduced. I think if anything, it's inevitable it's increased. Uh, but there's, I, even then, who knows? And this is all new territory. The NFL hasn't implemented this procedure before. It was adopted two years ago. We'll see how it plays out. But I would not say it's inevitable that it's going to be reduced on appeal. If anything, I would think it would be increased on appeal. Robbie NYC, given the events last week in Supreme Court land and the NFL official lack of a statement, do you agree that the NFL PA pales by comparison to the NBA PA? And is that the main reason? Well, the NBA and the NFL are two different leagues, obviously, and the unions are different. And right now, the NFLPA basically has a leadership vacuum because Demora Smith, who still doesn't have a contract for his final term, is in the process of being replaced once they find the next NFLPA executive director. And it was reported last week by Ben Fisher of Sports Business Journal that the executive committee of the NFLPA has hired a search firm to help them identify candidates. See, that, that's the challenge. The executive committee is made up of, of a bunch of players who now have to figure out who's our next executive director going to be. We need some help here. This isn't something you do every day. It hasn't happened since 2009 when they hired D. Smith. So I think right now, it's a, it's a difficult time to expect the NFLPA to do much of anything because they are in a period of transition that has lasted since last October and who, much, who knows how much longer it will last. But it's a great point because it's not like the union has come out and said anything regarding Friday's decision. Uh, and uh, maybe the NFL won't say anything unless and until the union pushes it to do so. Sean Alvashire. The Saints were criticized for being over-aggressive in the 2022 draft, but based on your reporting on the Cowboys and Dolphins deals for Peyton, could it be that Mickey Loomis has an idea of the hall of picks he is going to get for Peyton in 2023? I, are you replenishing a first-round pick next year? I mean, the way I hear it, Dolphins are ready to give up a first-round pick for Sean Payton. Now, after he's out for a year, does, does the value begin to drop? Depends on how many teams want Sean Payton. There could be multiple teams jockeying to get Sean Payton next year. And the reality is, even though the formal process plays out a certain way, it all kind of gets worked out behind the scenes before you even initiate the launch sequence. Because the way it works is new team contacts old team and says, we'd like to negotiate with your coach who's under contract with you. Old team and new team work out compensation that would change hands if new team hires the coach. Then once that compensation is worked out, new team has the green light to go talk to the coach. And this isn't a situation where coach is just sitting there minding his own business. And all of a sudden he gets a knock on the door. Some new team wants to hire him. He's like, oh, that's a shock to me. Everybody kind of knows what's going on before it happens. So look, they were aggressive this year to trade up in the draft. And I think they feel pretty good about their team this year. And yeah, maybe the fact that they know that they're going to get some value for Sean Payton next year, made them more willing to kind of go all in with what they have. The Saints are kind of in an unprecedented spot. Can you think of a time where a team's head coach leaves? A head coach who had become so synonymous with the organization and so widely viewed as responsible, along with Drew Brees, for its success. He leaves, pretty much everyone else stays. And now we see how it goes. No new coach brought in, no new personality 
to change things around. You know, I think of the Buccaneers in 2002, Tony Dungy out, John Gruden in. This would be kind of like Tony Dungy out and Monty Kiffin becoming the head coach of the team of the 2002 Buccaneers. This is Dennis Allen stepping in as the head coach. And we saw him do it last year and shut out the Buccaneers in prime time. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an intriguing experiment that I can't remember ever happening in the NFL. And, and I think the Saints, by virtue of the fact that they gave up draft capital to move up in the draft this year, that they believe they may be onto something. When you look at the NFC, who's to say that they don't have a chance to be highly competitive with the Buccaneers, who they have swept two straight years in the regular season? or other teams in the NFC. Where are the great teams in the NFC? We assume the Rams are going to be great. Maybe they will be. But let's not assume the Saints are going to be horrible just because Peyton's gone. It's going to be an interesting analysis. And I look forward to the day when Sean Payton, coaching some new team, crosses paths with the Saints because it's coming. I'm not sure about many things, but the day is coming when Sean Payton will be coaching a team against New Orleans Saints. Tacos and gin. NFL says it will push for a lengthy, unprecedented suspension for Watson. How long is that? They have done year suspensions before, maybe two years. Well, it's been reported, and I have no reason to doubt it, that the NFL is looking for indefinite, at least a year. The NFL is concerned about other cases being filed that would change the analysis. And I think the NFL is concerned about its ability to go back and punish Deshaun Watson again later. So let's just do it all now, indefinite. And then by the middle of next March, we should know, because by then the statutes of limitations will have expired. Assuming he stopped with the social media private massages when he was sued the first time, assuming that that was the end of it, and there's no one after mid-March of 2021 who's going to come forward and say, hey, he's still doing it, folks. He did it again. By the middle of next March, we should know the full universe of claims against Deshaun Watson. So maybe it'll be a year, maybe it'll be longer. That's all to be determined in the coming days, weeks, and hopefully not months. Hopefully it's just days and weeks. Let's see what else we have here. Da -da. Burn unit. Burn unit. Where are you at here? Uh, when it was reported that Jimmy G is hoping for a quick resolution once he can throw, is he indicating that trade talks are happening and coming to fruition? Uh, or is this supposed to be pressure on the Niners? Look, this is one of the more intriguing dynamics as we get closer to camp it was reported over the weekend that jimmy g will be cleared to throw soon we expected that once he's cleared to throw then maybe he gets traded the 49ers created the impression they had a trade ready to go and then the surgery happened and it was over and and at times i wonder do they know something we don't know is there a team out there that's just secretly waiting for jimmy g to be cleared and then they're going to trade for him like the like the texans are the texans ready to trade for him they're behind Davis Mills, Davis Mills, Davis Mills, Davis Mills, and then whoop, we'll go get Jimmy G once he's cleared. That could happen. You still have to deal with his contract, $25 million for this year, with no contract beyond 2022. Uh, Jimmy G's got a lot of power here. Because if, if someone's going to trade for him, they're going to want to do something about his contract. Extend it, reduce it. They're going to want to do something. All he has to say is no. And at some point he gets cut. And then the dance gets awkward. If the 49ers don't trade him and camp opens and he shows up and he says, hey, I'm here, your injury prone quarterback is reporting for duty and maybe he's going to get injured again and you're going to have to pay him $25 million in 2022. That's possible. Could get ugly, could get awkward. And I know the 49ers like to hide behind that, that notion that Jimmy's a nice guy. Jimmy's not going to upset the apple cart. Well, it's about time for Jimmy to upset the apple cart. And we'll see if he does, if he's not traded or released before the start of training camp. Worst case scenario for him. You get to the end of the preseason. He's perfectly healthy. The 49ers go to him and say, we'll keep you. We're only, we're only going to pay you $10 million this year. And if you don't like it, you get cut. He gets cut. Where's he going to go? Unless there's some fluke Teddy Bridgewater injury. And, and those happen very rarely. Quarterbacks are largely off limits during the preseason and training camp. They don't play very much. The starters don't during the preseason. So it, it's, you know, that one falls behind Baker Mayfield on the scale of awkward quarterback situations, it could get very awkward. And we've seen some indications that suggest Jimmy G is not going to play along. We'll see what happens if and when camp opens and he hasn't been traded or released. Let's see. One more question real quick, because I want to make sure everybody understands. 
circumstances. This is from Lewis United. Does the NFLPA have a responsibility to fight for Deshaun Watson when it comes to his suspension? Are they obliged to take his side in this? How does that whole situation work? This is very simple. The NFL Players Association has a duty under federal law to defend Deshaun Watson. Without question, an absolute duty. It's called a duty of fair representation. It's part of membership in the union. When the employer comes after you and tries to discipline you, the union, you pay your dues, you're a member of the union, has an absolute right to defend you. It becomes problematic when, for example, Richie Incognito, Jonathan Martin, you've got one union member who's the victim, another union member who's the aggressor, gets a little awkward. Not awkward in this situation. There's no one involved in any of this that is also represented by the NFLPA. So yes, the union will fight aggressively. And as I mentioned earlier, Jeffrey Kessler is on the case. He has been a thorn in the side of the league for years, and he will push a very aggressive argument, as mentioned earlier, about the idea that Deshaun Watson's punishment must be proportional to three owners who either weren't punished at all or were only mildly punished under the personal conduct policy. Where that issue goes may have a long way toward determining what happens to Deshaun Watson. Again, we'll be tracking it every day this week and beyond and everything else that's happening in the NFL. Slowest week of the year, my butt. It's going to be a busy week in the NFL, and we'll be here with you every step of the way. Thanks for some of your time. We'll talk again tomorrow. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.